Well, good morning um, and welcome to Bridgeway Baptist Sunday service. Uh, we just um, thank you that you guys are here and um, we welcome you. And we, um, we're starting a new um, series, short series in the book of Psalms, Psalm 62. And some may call it the only psalm. And um, why? Why is that? Well, we're about to find out. This um, popped out to me recently as I am reading through Psalms and my devotions. And, um, and Psalm 62 has just been such a great help to me. And I'd like to share what um, God's been working in my heart. And I hope you enjoy the benefits of depending on and believing on and putting your faith in God as literally the only thing that we actually need. We only need God and Him alone. This morning, as we open your Bibles to, to Psalm 62, I'd like to ask you a question. What's your favorite part of God's character? And is there something that he does that you know full well that no one else can do? Psalm 62 is a short chapter, and I think we can read the whole thing. And we'll kick off in verse 1. To the chief musician, to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall, you shall be as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Salah. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us, Salah. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression. Become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this, that power belongs unto God. And unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his worth. Let's pray this morning. Father, we just thank you, God, for your word and how powerful it is. Father, we thank you, God, that the Holy Spirit can minister to us, Father, at every stage of our lives. And God, we just ask that, Father, you would minister to us this morning. Father, you would minister to me. Father, that you be in our midst. Father, convicting us. Father, showing us. Father, I ask that you would be in the midst of us. And God, we thank you and we praise you. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As God dealt with my heart on this passage, he drawed me to two very simple words which are found in the verse 6. And um, in verse 2, so it's repeated in this chapter. And these words are, He only. I felt a call to return to focus on Him and Him alone. And that is my prayer for you too. That, and that we would all rest in the sufficient sufficiency of God. The all-sufficiency of God. And act on it. And so there are a few interesting parts to this chapter. But who is the He and He only? That's found in verse number one, where it says, To the chief musician, to the Jeduthun, uh, Psalm of David, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. So just in case it's not clear enough, the he and he only is referring to God. The word Elohim, or supreme God, or God Almighty. And, you know, that might be self-explanatory, but it's important that we know these things and we know who's addressed to. The word only is a word of, of great depth, really, and I, I didn't really know until I started studying this passage, and the word, uh, this word translated only appears six times in these 12 verses in this chapter. And its use is not only limited to the word only, it's used in the first word of verse 1 as truly. It is used in verse 9 as surely. And the rest of the time in this chapter, this word only is used and, and only is the most popular translation of this word, as well as surely. But the first mention of it in, was in the, time of, uh, in the times of Noah, in Genesis, back in Genesis chapter 23, 7 
chapter 7, verse 23, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him on the ark. And this word has two main uses. One, to show affirmation, and the Cambridge Dictionary defines the word affirmation as a statement or a sign that something is true. The other use for the word is a, a restrictive use, and, and, and it narrows down the meaning to a few or more often than not to one. Hence the word only. There's only one. So let's put this all together for a second. The word has a few uses. And the word can show that you believe that something is true, but it also restricts down and narrows it down to that something being one. And isn't that supposed to isn't that how we're supposed to speak about God? To speak in such a way that we show that we believe his word and we believe in him only. I've just been so captured by this word. What a word of faith that it is. What a word of commitment this is. What a word of sold out and waiting upon God this is. And I'm thankful for David's example. And in the context of this verse, even though it doesn't say when it was written, the scholars believe that it was written when his son Absalom took power and was seeking to overthrow David as king. And we can't know this for sure. And um, if this is true, it's not the first time that David's life has been sought after. What we do know for sure is that he was again dealing with some enemies. And let's have a look in verse 3 and 4. How long will he imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall, you shall be as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies, they bless with their mouth, and they curse inwardly to the land. So remember David speaking about some people. So we know that he was dealing with these enemies. What's interesting here is that he's kind of sandwiched what he's dealing with between two really faithful sayings. And he only writes two verses about it. And he follows this up. The next four verses after this is encouraging himself and his soul in God. And the language he uses, he, he expresses his confidence in God. And God alone, as he says, he only. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. We need this kind of confidence in our lives and um, or this confidence in God. And as I look around the room today, everyone is going through something. Maybe you aren't being hunted down for your life like, like David, but everyone is going through something. Different things, similar things. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to encourage you to have confidence in God and His ability. And led by the Holy Spirit, make your He only statement. Who is this He only to you? Who is this He only in your life? What has God done for you that you know full well that no one else could have done it? And I will be speaking on some He only statements from this chapter, and they are awesome truths for us. But my prayer for this series, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would continually remind me where God isn't my He only in my life. He might be a He plus. He might be a distant part. Or He may be no part at all. And that's what I pray would happen to me. And that the Holy Spirit would continually to identify areas in my life that it's me only. Or it's someone else only. And not He only. That's my prayer for you as well. Maybe you'll agree with me that our ten tendency is not to the he only, but it's rather to the if only statements. And once we use these if only statements, you have taken God out of the equation. If I can only get a big sum of money that falls down from the sky so I can buy all that I need, uh, aka want, he only is your provider. He only will meet your needs. I have found looking back on my life that this applies when, when I've been sick. And, and I, how many of you have been sick and um, you're uncomfortable and you just, you're just sick of being sick? And you say in your mind, if only the sickness would go away. He only is your healer. He only is the healer. Or something maybe a little bit um, easier to admit. Like, if only all this rain would stop, right? If you guys are in New Zealand, you know that we have just 
had so much rain. But at the end of the day, he only is our creator and he only is in control. It's applicable in our trials and I've been there. If only I can just get past this or if only this situation will go away and the problem with the if only statements is that if we are captured by them, we see things in a very mechanical way. An awkward or an uncomfortable, painful situation comes into your life and you say, whoa, that's not good. So then we start thinking about how we can get around it. How can we bypass it? How can we make it go away? Then it becomes me only. We treat it as a task situation. A, a task comes in, we quickly figure out how best to remove it and attempt it and sometimes it works. But when do we get the most frustrated? When we have tried and tried and tried, but this situation is going away. And you can see no end. That's when we get the most frustrated. Or when we don't have any control over the situation. That's when we get frustrated or discouraged. And sometimes when we reach the end is when we say, God, I just give this to you. And I say that we need to give our situations even our trials and everything we go to, to God first, because he only is God. He only is in control. He only allowed it in your life. The benefits of this is faith building as we go through things, even though we get hurt or whatever, our faith is strengthened and we see God move and work in our lives. And so many times God through the Holy Spirit, allows us to see the purpose of our trials, looking back on it, and many times we can see how we've grown in the area. Let's have a look at an illustration from the Bible. So just go with me, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 14, to a very familiar portion of Scripture. It is after John the Baptist has been beheaded, and they have hid the 5,000. And we'll pick up in Matthew 14, verse 22. And straight away Jesus constrained the disciples to get a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake to them, and saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid thou come unto, uh, bid me come unto the water, uh, unto thee on the water. Apologies. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. It's easy for us, looking back, to give Peter a hard time. But notice the Bible doesn't make any mention of anyone else stepping out on the water and walking on the water towards Jesus and, and, you know, it was Peter only. At the same time, it's pretty clear that Peter got caught up on the wind and his circumstances. Was he thinking he only? While he was looking at Jesus, was he thinking he only? Did he get caught up on the wind? Did he get caught up on his circumstances? Or was he thinking of what this would happen? What would happen to him? What might this situation bring to him? Aren't you glad that as Peter was sinking, that the Lord was there? As Peter was crying out, Lord, save me, the Lord grabbed him and said, Peter, why did you doubt? I can relate to Peter so many times in my life, and sometimes I can just see the object, and I don't look for God. Sometimes I just get captured by this object and this thing, instead of looking to God saying, He only. That's what I struggle with sometimes. I don't know what, what, um, what about you. They finish off this event by worshipping Jesus, saying, Thou art the Son of God. He only is the Son of God. He only is in control. I mean, He only is the Creator. 
He only knows his creation down to the very smallest of details. Do you not think he's in control? This ties up with a lot of things that pastors have been preaching recently, and it's literally practicing your faith. Every time you say, he only, and fill in the blank. It's also a great way to check your motive and ask yourself, why are you doing this? If you're doing this to glorify God and him alone, well, then that's great. If your motive isn't Christ-centered and it's not God-centered and him alone, then your motive is wrong. So now that I've introduced you to the topic, there are a couple of things that here that the um, Holy Spirit highlighted for me and they are found around the repeating of the phrase, he only. And I want you to ask yourself and pay attention to who is he talking to. And um, so I bring up point number one. David declared, he only, outwardly. In Psalm 62, verse 1 to 2, to the chief musician, to Jejuthun, the psalm of David. Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. You see in verse 1 in the heading of the Psalms that it was directed to the chief musician, to Jejuthun. And Jejuthun was one of three music leaders which were not only singers, but they played instruments as well. And we find that in Second Chronicles 5, uh, verse 12 to 13. And verse 12 says, Also the Levites which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jejuthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and, so and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. And, they, and, it, and uh, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one, to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when, it, when they lifted up their voices with their trumpets and their cymbals and their instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. And it's just such a great picture, isn't it? A great picture of believers gathering together, praising God as one voice, much like what you would do on a Sunday morning. And the presence of the Lord enters in. And, it, and, it, and this really makes me think about Psalm 22, 3, and it says, But thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. The word inhabitest here means to live, to abide, or to stay a while. And truthfully, guys, praise is such an important part of our relationship with God. As you see, he stays. He dwells in it. All of this highlights to me that the whole of Psalm 62 was to be used as praise unto God. Especially when David outwardly declares, He only is mine. Psalm 62, back to verse 1, where it says, Truly my soul waited upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Again, I ask, who is he speaking to? What is the language he's using? He is professing, he is declaring these truths in the psalm addressed to this chief musician. The statement of faith isn't directed at David himself, but it's directed outwardly to his chief musician. And for his musicians to sing to David and to the people there, and it was such a great reminder of our faith, needs to be communicated to people. We need to declare it outwardly. We need to declare that God is he only to people around us, not only to show that we have faith, but to show the strength of it. It is a bold statement. It is a sold out to God in faith statement. And you know what? This is how we build a strong community of believers. If you fathers and say to your wives, say to your children, he is God and he only is in control. If you wives would say to your husbands, to say to your kids, he only is our king and I will obey him. If we said to each other, he only is your healer, he only is your provider, and he only is your strength, he only fill in the blank. What encouragement would we have? This is such a great encouragement. This is such a great faith builder. And this is how we can encourage us to be a faithful generation not depending on anyone else, but God 
from God alone. Let's see how it affected David. As he declared his faith, notice here in verse 2, he says that I shall not be greatly moved. And then down in verse 5, he says, I shall not be moved. So he is gone after declaring this, he only statement outwardly, he has gone from, I will not be moved a great deal to, I will not be moved. Can you see the confidence build up as he declares his faith? Do you see how David is practicing his faith, increased his faith? This brings me to point two. David declared he only internally. And verse five says, my soul, my soul, wait upon only upon the God for he is my, for my expectation has come from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Notice the repetition of he only is my, but notice that he starts in verse five. So again, I'm asking, who is he talking to? He, what does he start with? My soul. He's talking to his soul. As much as we need to declare it to others, we need to declare it to ourselves that he only is God. Notice how David directs his soul to wait upon the Lord because he only is my hope. That word expectation means hope because he only is my rock and my salvation. My defense, I will not be greatly moved. The same goes for us when we, we have the ability to direct our thoughts or the traffic, if you will, in your mind and in your soul. And this is, this is stirring up yourself. This is encouraging yourself. And let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, 19 as Paul is speaking a caution against all manner of uncleanness and listing duties for the believer. And he's saying in Ephesians 5 verse 19, he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. We need to declare to ourselves the psalms, the hymns, the spiritual songs, which will help us through directing our thoughts and stirring ourselves up in encouragement and focusing on a thought and dwelling there. It'll help us find patience when we say to my, to my soul, wait upon the Lord. We will find encouragement when we say, my soul, my hope is from God. I will not be moved. We will find strength, not our strength, but his strength. When we say, my soul, he only is my rock and my salvation. We will find rest when we say, my soul, if he is my rock and my salvation, then I will not be greatly moved. I hope you take some time to hear from the Holy Spirit this morning and, and this weekend. And in the weeks coming, I want to ask you, what is your he only statement? What is the Holy Spirit going to write in that blank for you? He only is my what? I pray that you would allow the Holy Spirit to minister and to allow the Holy Spirit to fill in the blank as you acknowledge that all you truly need is God, the only.